process. So basically what we are trying to do, we try to apply data analytics in audit process. We have a bit strange name called MAT. It stands for multidimensional audit data selection. So I'm going to give you a background first. You're the biggest man. <laughs> <laughs> so the data analytic technique is a popular nowadays. And by applying these data analytic techniques in terms of auditing, we can move from traditional sampling approach to you know, full population analysis. One of the limitations is whenever we apply these data analytic techniques, it often gives us a larger, large number of outliers. So in terms of audit, we see in practice of dealing with those you know, the outliers. And so we believe you know, there's supposed to be some sort of guideline and framework that has auditor effectively dealing with this large number of data, and at the same time, they can handle those uh, our So that is the main purpose of this uh, project. So to help auditor to apply these data analytic techniques, at the same time, they can handle a large number of our We came up with a framework called multi-dimensional audit data selection framework. We developed this framework based on fire literature and professional guideline. And this is a current version of framework. It could be changed later. And we modify this framework several times based on radar board, uh, the response from the radar board, and also you know, those, our colleague and give us lots of you know, uh, comments. So based on this comment, we came up with this framework. It consists of six components. But some of them are overlap with the typical data analytic framework. And it is, uh, the practice of these six components is tied by you know, overall audit objective and risk assessment and materialities. The first thing what it suggests is the auditor try to apply data analytic techniques. And the first thing what we suggest is you know, identify what are the objectives and also the criteria which you can evaluate. So by the way, this framework intentionally is not for substantive testing. Um, Substance tests of a uh, transaction, but it could be used for the test of control or it could be used by you know, test of balance as well. Once you identify objective and criteria, next step is how this is to collect the data and try to understand what kind of data it exists. And once you've done that and we move to uh, data preparation, most data that you collect most likely is not in the form and you can apply data analytics. So in this stage, you have to find out you know, those missing data, merge them, you have to devise them, you have to prepare data, you know, or maybe you can apply data on these things. In this stage, I believe, and sometimes you have to go back to the previous stage and try to figure out whether there is additional data you needed to combine the processor data, and you can go back and get it. Once everything is uh, you know, done, and this is the main core of this framework. This is what the approach we suggest. I'll give you more detail about this. So we start with the full populations. So entire population, it could be uh, you know, transactions, it could be balance, it could be a test of control the data set. So what we suggest is start with this one and apply uh, the set of filters. We suggest when you develop this set of filter based on your risk assessment, the ask yourself, so I ask yourself, what could go wrong? So for instance, if you do the sales transaction, you know, what risk do you have in this sales transaction? Based on this, you know, your analysis or risk assessment, you can find out how you can test it. This is what I'm saying is a different. When you apply this filter, obviously, you will get outputs. So we call this a notable item. And most likely, you have a bunch of an outlier, which, as I said, is in fact the between the data and the handles uh, outlier. So what is the best go to the you know, data analytic techniques? It could be simple as you know additional filter, or you can use a visualization technique. As you can see, when you plot them, you can find out those green group are uh, deviated from the rest of the group. So you can consider that this is outlier, or you can use professional judgments. Based on my professional, uh, professional judgment and experience, I believe uh, this is based on. Or if you go about you know, using machine learning techniques, like outliers 
protection you can use clusters or relations or uh, classification of sorts. And by applying these data lake okay. you have exceptional exception, you have outliers. And we call it this, this exceptional item. Now obviously this exceptional item, some of them are more riskier than other ones. Okay. So what it suggests is try times them. So put the first one as more riskier than the last one, it's less risky. And this is how we suggest to the prioritization, you can use proficient judgment. So for instance, specific transaction, if you need more riskier than other one, you can put weight on it or you can use how club you know, step one step two research. Or you can use a dollar amount. It's <laughs> I'll show you some of the examples in a little bit. And then you have a prioritized exceptional item and based on these uh, items you suggest the auditor to you know, do the following of task. So feel free to ask me. Oh, no. <laughs> So when you done this uh, model, obviously, you may go back to the previous case and with the data set, you may collect more, uh, that, you know, more data set. So once you finalize this model, they suggest to implement an operate plan and do the post evaluation. So this is not a one-year project, one-year, you know, one-time solution. If you've done this in you know, three or four years, you'll have much better you know, model which can detect now, I was thinking that yeah, the model can run continuously. Which means it, it runs like, instead of once a year. Uh, so you can do it every, every, every month. Year, every month. Every you can do it. Right. It, 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 was a design, it was a design for the next audit. Okay. So, so you can run it anytime. You can run it anytime. Okay. They pull it up to you. And it's a test of control. Okay. Okay. This is an interesting question. Can we redesign the math analytic framework? For a continuous audit, somehow. I think you can do it, but the yeah. problem is, you know, the PCA will be. Oh, the, the problem. That's how it's done. But they don't no, say no, that's no, a problem. I, I huh? They said PCA they're not the problem. Yeah, they're not the problem. <laughs> they're never the problem. They, they <laughs> don't think they're the problem. <laughs> no, the thing is, what I'm going to say is, uh, when I draw up PCA, it would be the problem, but you do more than what you're required, it should happen. Yes. It doesn't no, matter. Yeah. You can learn it every single right. day, or so you can learn it by months, or quarter, or year. Why not? We, we do exactly the same thing. Uh, but we call it differently. But uh, our, our issue is always data collection, because right. sometimes the data that we collect, we don't need to collect the data. Our data are not in digital format. So sometimes that's a big challenge. So uh, I believe when you apply this framework, 80% of your time is spent Understanding data, you know, right. and preparing data in a form that you should find out data. So anyway, so what we did, once we developed this framework, we apply these, uh, the framework <coughs> in four major business processes. What is revenue, expenditure, payroll, and general ledger. For this presentation, I'm going to show you how I apply this framework to expenditure side. We are talking about procure to pay process. So this is for each summary of the data set. We got this data set one of the education uh, you know, website, and it's one year, which is year 2000 to you know, uh, June to year 2017. So we have almost 2.3 million transactions on record. And when you summarize in the invoice level, we have 5,234 invoices. So that's our overall population. And then we apply those, uh, you know, the, the math framework. So we start with the first step. Here is what it is. <coughs> so the first step, what it suggests, identify potential risk factor. Simply put, we are asking auditor, find out what could go wrong. In this example, procure the take process. So we came up with those list of you know, the, uh, the what could go wrong. Purchase are made during the middle business hours. Purchase are not properly approved, which you can easily identify. And obviously, applying, you know, developing filter to you know, check out you know, all those risk factors doesn't, you know, it is impractical. It doesn't make sense for me. So what it suggests, you know, try to find out based on your prior experience, your knowledge, which one is, you know, significant risk factor that associate with the transactions. So that's 
the process what it is. When you determine this significant potential risk factor, we suggest saying go back to the objective and try here and find out what is the what is the you know goal you want to you know, accomplish. So in our example, you do a certain existence and at least a certain and based on this we identify how we 
we can take those suspicions for which multiply the amount by those violations for which you have the number and based on this in the code you find out. And that's the final one. So uh, here is the summaries. So we start with in a large number of our uh, large number of you know transactions, we apply first filter, which give us 384 invoices. And then we apply second filter in the statute, which gives us a PPA, and we try to hide that. And we got the results of those you know, high end. So we suggest the whole different. You know, use this sample, use this item in the you know, uh, substance test. Is there a minimum before you can run this model? Because uh, I know in machine learning you need a sizable amount yes. of data. Yes. Uh, is there like a, is, can you run it like in 200,000 data? Yes. Yeah, yeah, two point, two yes. Point. yes, you can do it. So, so the size of the data set doesn't, <coughs> doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. That, yeah. if there are, it depends on your system. If the system is, you know, not powerful enough, Right, not often enough. And uh, what I'm suggest is combine those large data into groups. That could be one, you know, you can reduce those, you know, from like in the time processing. You can reduce those to processing time. I was just thinking, it's like to get e procurement. Can you can explain what they're trying to do with yeah. how e procurement is. Anyway, 
So this is the evaluation I just want to skip it. We passed it, it looks okay. So we, we compare with the statistical sampling approach. It's just monitoring the sampling with the, you know, that non-statistical sampling with this approach. And since I don't have time, you know, I'm not going to share more, but anyway, found it works. But you know, this is based on data sets. So we, as the Nicholas said, we currently what we are doing, we're actually parallel read, you know, actually audit that audit team and apply traditional audit approach to the MAD approach and we try to evaluate the results. But that, as I said, in here there are several approaches you can apply. And the first one what I showed you is about filter, subsequent filter. This one using cluster. So that in terms of you know, the machine learning technique, there are two major ones. One is a sub, uh, supervised yes. and a supervised. The supervised one is if you know the answer, existing data set set, this is fraud or not. We can use this information when you run it, when you run this machine learning. But unfortunately, we don't have it. So the only option we have is cluster. But what I'm trying to say is if you have the existing data set that indicates this is fraud or not, We'll have much better results by using this classification language. But you know, since we don't have it, we apply it clustering. So just in case you don't understand clustering, just one minute, you know, that the summary is it's nothing special. Let's say you have a data set, a bunch of you know, occupation, age, and education. Cluster is nothing special. Sometimes you want to group them based on where they live. This is one area of cluster area based on you know, what they do. We can use a combination of both. So where they, what they do, where they live. This is cluster, it's nothing special. So given the data set, based on what you're interested in, you can group them, that's the cluster. And then a bunch of algorithm, but the core of algorithm is try to reduce reading distance minimize reading distance and maximize between group. That's the cluster. To make sure that the groups are very different from each other. Right. So try to you know, put same data into the same group and, and, and then divide these group based on between group distance. That's the whole idea. There are several approaches. And so that what we did to be using expecti uh, expectation minimization model based on you know, our given our data set, and then we apply just like what what we did that those attributes we choose is you know based on filter and also the some of the things we need to leave is we have to take into account you know, invoice data amount and something like that and. You know, we are living in the world, a pretty nice world. You know, there is a software. You don't have to you know, do the full mm -hmm. thing. There is a web app. When you plug in those attributes with the data set, when you push the button, it will cluster them like this. And that's free? Yes, it's free. Yeah. It's free. Yeah. Yeah. And one of my PhD okay. students, uh, who is now back in Thailand, she did a dissertation. And she tested it against the SAS cluster, right. and she thinks this is much better than SAS. So it gave me those eight clusters. So that based on this algorithm, it clusters the data set into eight groups. The question is, which one? Right. So here is the thing. This is what you know the, uh, the you know, auditors just judgment is that in their experience. So what he did, we used the materiality, performance materiality one percent. We used the dollar amount. So we apply this dollar amount in our cluster. This has a cluster. When you draw the line based on this materiality, the performance materiality that amount. So some of the group are below this materiality amount, and these three groups are in you know, some sort of you know, violation. I don't know whether it's a violation. But this is belongs to this materialization. So we consider those three groups as our exceptional group. <coughs> so pretty much the same thing. This I don't, pretty much we apply the same, you know, the concept of five times then. This is you know the summary of what it does. So 77, the previous one gave us 58 and 77. 
So as I said, there are several approaches, several ways you can apply this, depend on your understanding, your experience in this. And this is one example. We have three more that other group, revenue, payroll, and general ledger, he did it. Jamie. It's, so <laughs> <laughs> it's like a couple hours a day. No. Uh, it's actually interesting that you guys mentioned the data um, encryption situation. We had a similar problem with the general ledger. They didn't want to give us everything, um, but we were still able to make it work. And what we did to kind of get around it also was we used other data sources they were willing to share with us that were related. Um, so yeah, it's all about what types of filters you want to use, things like that. But it'll work with, with the data masking and stuff like that. So I don't want to spend too much time. So I'll, I'll, I'll be here. So we may done the presentation. You know, keep presenting. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be very interested. In yeah, we are very, very love to do an experiment with you guys.